Good morning. I'm Bruce Havens, pastor at Arlington Congregational Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you if you've watched us on Facebook before. We know these are strange times, but we wanted to at least try to offer this as a way to worship, even though we do not have an open church this morning for worship. So thank you for joining us. I'm going to share the scripture and the message that we would have used in worship this morning for you. And I, uh, again, thank you for being here with us. Our scripture lesson this morning is from the Gospel of John in the fourth chapter, beginning in the fifth verse. The whole story takes 42 verses. I'm not going to read all of those for you, but I'm going to give you the essence of this story that is a powerful message of the way in which an encounter with Jesus changed life. So Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me? A Samaritan, a woman of Samaria. Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob? who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks, drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water, gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never again be thirsty, or have to keep coming here to draw water. Here ends this portion of the Gospel reading. May God bless us as we read it and hear it, as we reflect on it, and as we seek to respond to it faithfully. Well, I have to admit, when I picked the theme, Where Will You Go, for Lent, I had no idea that question might be a literal one, and that we'd be wondering, where are you going to be able to go, or where should you not go? Imagine a world like this six weeks ago, a world of coronavirus, of self-isolation, the cancellation of virtually all sporting events and a lot of church events, and store shelves empty of toilet paper and God knows what else. So where will you and I go when we can't even go to church? This morning we wanted to do this, as I said before, for those of you who are at least digital savvy enough to find your way to Facebook and find us. And again, thank you. The scripture I read just a moment ago captures the story of someone who is the definition of the other. And we live in a culture right now that defines everybody as whether they are in or they are the other. And in our current stranger-fearing attitude, we fear the Asian with the coronavirus, the brown-skinned Latino coming over to be in a gang or to sell drugs or to murder. We're scared of women who speak up for themselves that have been abused. We're scared of people of other genders, other religions, other sexual orientations. We're scared of everybody who is an other. Our fear meter can be off the charts. This woman was an other. She came to this well and she met someone who was in a sense other to her. But Jesus, rather than treating her as an other, saw her as a human being, fully loved, fully embraced by God. Her distances, her otherness, were defined by being a woman in a culture where men had all the power, being a person of a different religion and race from Jesus, being a person where if she came to that well at noon, it probably meant she wasn't welcome when all the other women of the village went to the well at dawn. What other reason would there be for her 
to be at that well at noon, other than that she was not only other to people like Jesus of a different race and religion, but she was other even to those of her own village, perhaps because of her marital status. You see, in her world, the only value a woman had was based on who the man was in her world. Her father, when she was a child, her husband, when she was of an age to marry, her son, if she was a widow, and as Jesus found out, this woman had been married five times, but was not married to the person she was with at the time. A lot of people have a way of judging others, don't they? Jesus, instead of judging her as other, spoke to her, asked her for a cup of water, and then offered her something even greater. All of this reminds me of a situation where we're in this problem with a virus, a, an illness. It reminds me of something that almost 40 years ago was a powerful, fearful time around another kind of virus. Let me tell you more about that. Dan Clenenden, a pastor and writer, shares the story of a friend of his that he got to know, a doctor, Arthur Amon, who in 1982 was the director of the Pediatric Immunology and Clinical Research Center at the University of California Medical Center in San Francisco. Art was treating a woman and her three children, or three of her children, all of whom were suffering from an unknown illness. The woman was a prostitute and an intravenous drug user. Talk about other. All four had unusual deficiencies in their immune systems. They were aggravated by opportunistic infections. They did not fit normal medical models of disease. The same patterns that Art had been studying in gay men ever since the year before a researcher at UCLA had identified a new disease called AIDS. Art determined that the mother and all three children had contracted AIDS. This was a fatal diagnosis at that time. Equally terrifying was the conclusion, hotly contested and very controversial, that HIV AIDS was not limited to adults or specifically to gay men. He determined that the disease had passed from the mother to her children as an acquired, not inherited, disease. He thus documented the first cases of AIDS transmission from mother to infant. Later in that year, in a separate case of an infant who had received more than 20 blood transfusions from 19 different donors, Art identified the first case of AIDS transmission by blood transfusion. This was so controversial that the New England Journal of Medicine and the British journal Lancet refused to publish it until almost a year later. And it wasn't until 1985, almost three years later, that there was a test approved for use in blood banks to identify HIV in blood donor blood. Since then, Art has been not just a leading expert at the center of the AIDS crisis, but also a tireless and vocal activist, especially for women and children who have been impacted by HIV and AIDS. Women and children have also been the most ignored, particularly in the poorest parts of our world and the poorest countries like war zones. Indeed, all scientific advances, tools, and knowledge necessary to begin the process of eradicating HIV in infants and children were in place by 1996. And here it is, 2020. ZDV, to take just one important example, was the first antiretroviral drug approved by the FDA in record time in 1987. But think about this. Art study shows that, and this was written four years ago, an estimated 21 million of HIV-infected individuals are still not any, on any treatment, according to the United Nations AIDS research in 2016. If you're lucky enough to live in a wealthy country, you have access to state-of-the-art drugs that now control HIV. In parts of Africa, HIV is still in a phase referred to as a hyper-epidemic. 
and treating children with that highly effective ZDV has been, has been mired in endless controversy. This is the, for a number of reasons. A lot of it has to do with what art calls bureaucratism. That is, in governments and in research facilities, this kind of thing happens around turf wars, research funding, government gridlock, drug company profits, and self-interest, and conflicts of interest, and counterproductive treatment guidelines by the World Health Organization. All these have made the epidemic still a reality. The good news is we have the means to treat every single individual, but we have not yet done that. We could, but we have not. Any comment directed towards blaming someone who hasn't been treated is just wasting time sitting by the well while someone dies of thirst, and we have the bucket to give them a drink from it. Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well reminds us that the community he brought, he inaugurated, calls for us to be a people of inclusion, not exclusion, of dignity, not degradation, of empowerment rather than exploitation, and of affirmation rather than marginalization. His simple request for a drink of water provoked a dialogue with a marginalized woman that teaches us that God does not desire any human being to shrivel and die from a broken body or a parched soul. Rather, he longs to quench our deepest needs and desires with the living water of his spirit. When you connect the dots of her story, you realize she epitomizes the many ways society, society marginalizes people. Jesus shattered all the taboos surrounding that woman, and he still does it today. The Samaritan woman displayed a real spiritual thirst, a candor about her many problems, and genuine insight about her real needs. Yes, she was thirsty. She needed literal water, but she also needed the spiritual water of knowing that she was included in the human family, that her life mattered as much as anyone else's. She needed that living water. Spiritual nourishment can become way more important than material sustenance when one is dying because no one is willing to express the love of Jesus Christ. In so many gospel stories, we see God's alternative community by the way Jesus reaches out to the other. John 4, where this come from, comes from, subverts and reverses our conventional human wisdom and power relations. Jesus not only engaged a disreputable, ostracized foreign woman, he cast her as the hero of the story. She goes to her community and shares with them the good news about a man from God who had the power to help each person discover their value in God's economic system. As co-chair of the Northeast Florida World AIDS Committee, this current pandemic slash virus reminds me of that one with AIDS that is currently still going on. With AIDS, we blame the victims. We denied our, our common humanity. We dehumanized those suffering instead of seeking to heal, to treat, or to at least show some common human compassion and decency. 21 million are still untreated because of greed, human limits, and ignoring God's call of inclusion, and love, and compassion. Here's the thing for me. If I'm thirsty like you, I know where to get water. Well, okay, don't go to Walmart because the shelves there don't have any. But I know where there's a drinking fountain here in the church. I know where to get a Coke. I could probably even find a martini or some other drink if I wanted it. And you probably can too, if that's your thing. But a lot of the world can't say that. Even water is a scarcity in our world and becoming more so. And it's becoming commercialized and controlled so that those who need it most have the least access to it. This isn't the world that Jesus Christ envisions. 
And so, as a pastor, I'm supposed to urge you to say to you, where will you go when you're thirsty? Go to Jesus. And I will say that. When you're thirsty, when your spirit is thirsty, go to Jesus. But if you're looking for more than just a cup of water, realize that there's probably somebody else who's thirsty as well. And a lot of us need to realize that nothing else is going to slake our thirst or satisfy our desires like Jesus. And at the same time, when we make someone else an other instead of a brother or sister in Christ, then we miss the opportunity to take a deep drink from the well of living water. Jesus didn't have a bucket to get down into that water. There will be times in our lives when we won't have that bucket spiritually. But there will be someone who may come along and give us that drink that we need so much. That word of compassion. That help that we need. That encouragement for our soul. Will we do that for the other? If we do, the interesting thing is that we will find that living water will well up like a gushing spring within us too. And we'll never run out. That's the way love works. And the love of God is such a powerful spring of living water. There's more than enough for all. Amen.